My Expat Taxes is the most trusted software for U.S. expats. Filing from abroad can be complicated, but My Expat Taxes makes it simple with their award winning software. E file instantly and chat with U.S. expat tax specialists. No tax situation is too complicated. Welcome to Global Take, presented by School Rubric, a show about the international teaching experience. Teaching internationally is one of the best decisions you can make as an educator. In this show, we will meet teachers and administrators from around the globe, living and working internationally. Our hope is that their stories and experiences will inspire you to explore the world of education. We will learn about all aspects of international teaching, from becoming an international teacher, to what countries are the best fit for you, to the challenges of being away from your home country. Come take this unforgettable journey to the world of international schools with Global Take, presented by School Rubric. So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today. We've got a really special episode coming up of Global Take. So Global Take is the show that discusses topics in international education. My name is Sadie Hollins. I'm a head of sixth form based in Chiang Mai in the north of Thailand. And I'm here um, co-hosting for the first time with my very special co-host. Uh, I'm Laura Davies. Uh, I am the athletic director of uh, the same international school in Chiang Mai in Thailand. Um, and yeah, delighted to be co-hosting with Sadie, my wife, and to be joined by all of our amazing guests today. Um, so we're just going to go around. OK, so <laughs> just to Got introduce you to the episode today. So um, today's episode is going to be focusing on LGBTQ plus inclusion in international schools. So we've got lots to discuss here today. We're going to be talking about creating safe spaces in our school and how to support our students. Uh, we're going to be looking, exploring about uh, of leadership's role in inclusion. And we're also going to be exploring the experiences of our panelists today, the, the challenges that they've faced and uh, also um, the things that they've overcome to help share with the audience today and then looking at how we can move forward from this. Um, so it, the hope is that this is an honest and informative discussion today and I am so excited to be joined by our panellists. I'm a huge fan of every single one in this room so I, I can't wait to get into this discussion. So if we just go around and do a quick uh, introduction of your, your name, um, what school you're coming from, where, where you're at today, um, that would be great. So if we can ask uh, Christina to kick us off please. Hi, my name is Christina. I am currently the head of drama at BBIS and I use the pronouns she and her. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christina. It's really nice to uh, connect with you from Germany today. Um, if we go around next to uh, Jeremy, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Jeremy Majewski. I'm the uh, principal at Frankfurt International School's B Spot in campus. We're a small uh, preschool through eighth grade campus um, under the Frankfurt International School umbrella. Um, I just moved here just a couple of months ago, um, by, uh, originally from Chicago, um, but spent the last five years at the American School of Barcelona. So excited to be here with you all. Perfect. Great to have you here, Jeremy. And last but not least, uh, over to you, Justin. Sure. Uh, my name is Justin. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the ELD coordinator at Chiang Mai International School in Northern Thailand. Thanks for having me. Perfect. It's so nice to connect with you all. Um, we've known you all through Twitter and other social media channels, but it's really nice to actually uh, get to speak with you in person today. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Laura now. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're going to go straight into the first question because we know that's what uh, people are here for. So the first thing we're going to talk about um, is how we can support our LGBTQ plus students to be their most authentic selves. How can we support our LGBTQ plus students so that they can be their most authentic selves? Uh, 
All right, so really excited to hear what you all have to say on this. Um, and we're gonna move around uh, the group, um, starting with Justin. Sure, uh, yeah, I think this is a really important question that spans across the in entire school. Um, it really starts it at the primary level. My specialty is, is working with lower primary, uh, but I've noticed a lot of these conversations center middle and high school. But it really starts at the lower primary, even though queer identities are typically a little bit less visible. Um, it's still important to you know, provide a space where students can feel safe and their identities can be celebrated. And in the lower primary, that even could look, look like something as simple as liking a certain color or playing with a certain toy. Um, you know, when we create those safe spaces, everybody um, just has the opportunity to be themselves. Right. Thank you, Justin. I think that's such an important point. And, and you're so right that we often skip over uh, the lower years when we when we talk about this. Um, we're going to move up to high school level. Um, and Christina, you were going to share your thoughts on your experience. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the number one thing, particularly in the secondary school for me to do is just to be authentic um, and be visible. And, you know, I have a four year old daughter who is constantly outing me wherever I go, um, especially if we're together as a family. So um, I'm not not used to that. Um, but at school in particular, I choose to be visible. Um, and I know that and I want to say this specifically because I know that choosing to be intentionally open and visible comes with a lot of privilege. I know that a lot of international school educators out there and students, they don't have those privileges afforded them. They may be in different contexts where they could be fired. They're not legally protected. Um, and so a lot of my ability to be authentic is rooted in privilege. And I just wanted to mention that straight away. Um, so being authentic allows me to then interact and engage with the students because, you know, if I can't do that in my context in Berlin, I mean, how can other international schools, students and educators do that in more difficult or different situations and contexts where it's not legal? That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, you raise a, a great point about obviously, you know, your daughter and, and, and choosing to be visible, but also sometimes, you know, being forced to come out. Um, and I'm sure we've all felt in various scenarios that that pressure to, you know, we have to make split second decision about how open we're going to be. Um, and that's, you know, always a really interesting choice to, to wrestle with. Um, Jeremy, from, from your perspective as a school leader, um, what, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I'm thinking of two things right now. I think, first of all, um, I appreciate, first of all, Christina mentioning how we are privileged, some of us, and that we can come out and we are in safe spaces in order to do so. Um, I've learned over the years how important it is for me to be out um, with myself. Um, and I myself have a partner and um, a son in the school as well. So we're, we can't really hide because of who we are. Um, but I have learned how important it is um, for us to be out and visible. I think. Um, you know, I had a, a teacher in Barcelona come to me and say, you know, Jeremy, you know, the reason I came to the school and work at the school um, is because I follow you on social media. I have learned that the school has, uh, you know, a, a gay administrator who's out um, and I want to be at that school. I want to be at a school where I know I'm safe, accepted and, and feel welcome. And I think it starts at the top and I'm, I, I don't take that responsibility lightly. I think that's really important. Um, the second thing I, I think about, particularly with making our, our schools uh, a little bit safer for our students, is, is what we're doing as schools to create um, spaces or visibility for all different types of families um, and, and students as well. I just finished my doctoral research on looking at um, experiences of gay and lesbian families in, in schools and what kind of hurdles are they overcoming, what's getting in their way. Um, and sometimes it comes down to those simple things such as you know paperwork or asking people to fill out uh, forms and asking for parents information. You know, 
no more, you know, who's the mother, who's the father? Why, why can't we just have a couple of blanks and ask people to self-identify themselves? Um, you know, bathrooms, why can't we just have some gender neutral signage or, you know, some signage around the building that makes um, many people may not pick up on, but those few within the schools who are looking for those signs, um, they automatically feel safe because they see that rainbow sign or whatever it is around the school. So I think um, just some of those little things that we can do can have a big impact on, on our, our larger school community as well. Yeah, I think you've, you've raised some really great points there, Jeremy, and thank you for that. I think this, this idea of safety um, is so important for students and for parents um, and even, you know, for, for our fellow colleagues, our teachers. Um, and there's this, you know, I suppose this point at which we also want to step maybe past just safety and also celebration even. Um, I mean, Justin, do you, what's your sort of take on this in, in the early years? Have you used any strategies to kind of try and create this, this idea of safety for your younger students or for their families? Yeah, I think the, the best access point that I've found is through children's books. Um, I'm really intentional about the children's books that I read that represent and celebrate um, lots of different identities and genders and sexualities. And we have really open conversations um, about these characters. And, you know, younger, young students at very early years, especially like when they're about five or six, have already an understanding of gender norms. Right. Um, so a lot of that, too, is kind of combating those within the classroom and kind of questioning those. Combating isn't the right word because there is no like friction or there's no um, tension, but it's really just like questioning those and getting younger children to think about, you know, what are these norms and how can I challenge them? And actually, I had a press question for Christina being a parent. I don't mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> but Bye. when you're sharing, um, and I was wondering, like, as a parent in an ele because your daughter is in preschool right now, I think age four, right? When yes. she enters kindergarten and first grade, like, how, what would you hope that an inclusive classroom looks like for, for your daughter? I mean, it even begins in the early years program at our school, you know, it's so important. And I'm so grateful that our school, um, her teacher has, you know, our family photos up on the wall. Um, that's just such a big part of it. And they have conversations about our family. And of course, all the other students or the other ki the children's families. Um, and already knowing that, you know, there are different family structures from that young means that they're not surprised um, when they get into, you know, primary school and then, of course, middle school and high school. I think it's really important that kids are introduced to these different family structures and different gender norms and challenging those gender norms from such a young age because the media tends to disproportionately, um, you know, represent um, these differences or perceived differences in negative ways. And so making sure that that's already, that conversation is already had earlier on is really important. And like you said, children's books, songs, different videos, texts that you're reading and looking at in the classroom is really important. Yeah, Justin, um, you know, your reference to ch using children's books, I think is perfect. Um, and it's a great springboard to have some conversations. I just got done last week reading to our kindergarten class, the book, Neither. Um, it's a beautiful book um, that really takes a look at the two binaries and, and says, you know, why does it have to be this way or that way? And to be quite honest, I mean, we didn't, the, the conversation didn't go into necessarily talking about individuals, but, you know, genders, but we talked about why does it have to be that boys are playing soccer and girls are playing Barbies? Why can't we, you know, do some of those things and helping the students to understand that those lines, you know, can be blurred and, and should be blurred for many people. Yeah, That's thank you guys for sharing that. That's that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> shout out to the to the book. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask before before we move on in terms of um, you know the older students. Then we've talked a little bit about about the early years and, and elementary students, but in high school, I mean, Christina, what sort of strategies does your school use? Do you have any you know GSAs or or anything similar for for students? Yeah, so particularly for the secondary school students, we have a GSA. Um, the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, formerly called the Gay Straight Alliance, um, is a real starting point for international schools and just all schools in general, uh, because it really creates a safe space for those students to truly 
just be who they are and not have to worry about, um, you know, the heteronormativity um, and the gender normativity that is always constantly around us. And, um, you know, our GSA has been going for 15 years and it's not the answer for everything to end all homophobia, transphobia and queerphobia, um, but it is a starting point for queer students to feel like they are seen, that they're heard, and just to be able to have free conversations um, and help to, I guess, unpack some of that as well. Because, you know, I was having a conversation with um, one of my friends and colleagues at the school, and she was saying that, you know, going through all of the discomfort and the harassment and the discrimination as she was growing up really helped to build her character. And I know that she's watching. So <laughs> I hope that's okay <laughs> that I'm sharing this. Um, and I challenged that and I was like, you know what? Yes, it does help to build character, but it shouldn't be that way. Kids should not have to grapple with their identity and have this inner turmoil for so long when other students are not having that um, worry. And, you know, I don't think that they should be worrying about that. They should be worrying about like the fact that I give them so much homework or something <laughs> silly like that, as opposed to like, oh my gosh, should I come out? Shouldn't I come out? Um, what, like, am I non-binary? Am I not? Can we not just worry about other things and not have to worry about all the harassment and discrimination that comes with being queer or non-binary? So I just, you know, GSAs are a great starting point, but there is obviously a lot more that we have to do. And just to help other schools, I guess, to start this, especially if you're an educator out there who's worried about starting one, you know, align your GSA with the school's mission and the guiding statements, because it's really difficult for a school to say no, that that space cannot exist if your school espouses um, values of inclusion and diversity, you know, make sure that those things are truly visible in the school and use that to your advantage in being able to start a GSA. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. And um, yeah, I think some really, really sound advice. Um, before we move on, Jeremy, do you have anything to share about your school's approach um, in terms of, you know, creating those safe spaces or, or celebrating student identity? Well, it's funny um, that you mentioned the you know, GSAs. I just had this week, actually yesterday, I met with um, our middle school. We have just over 50 students. And so it's a it's a really small community. But I had three students come and finally meet with me and say they're ready to start a, a GSA and they see a need for it. Um, we have one on our larger campus, you know, so FIS has a has a campus of, you know, almost 1800 students um, and, and they want like to create this as our campus as well. And, and I engage them in a conversation. I mean, immediately they wanted to go to, well, let's celebrate, you know, pansexual day. Let's celebrate bisexual awareness day. Let's let's celebrate, um, you know, the, the um, pride month. And I said, well, let's go a little bit further than that. Why don't we start with, you know, what do we have around the school? What are we currently doing, you know, to create a culture like, yeah, 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 that's it. And so I, I think it does go back to looking at all different areas within the school and, and wonder, can we see ourselves represented in that area, no matter who we are, um, no matter where we come from? And um, that's that's exciting work that uh, we'll be doing on our campus in the, in the coming months. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I, I really like that you you mentioned there, you know, it's great to have these celebrations, these one off days and pride events and, and awareness events. But really looking at what our schools are, are doing is so important and seeing how we can you know, change things for the better uh, for our students. So thank you so much. And um, before we move on, I'm just going to say to anyone watching, if you have any questions for our panel, um, if you want to ask anything directly to us while the show is going on, please post them uh, in the chat. They will come through to us and we'll uh, try and respond when we can. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I think we will uh, move on to question two, please. Have you ever experienced any barriers to LGBTQ plus inclusion within your schools? How were you able to overcome them? Yeah, so um, talking about a, quite, a, quite a personal and quite challenging question about um, barriers to LGBTQ plus inclusion in, in your schools um, and, and hopefully ways in which that you've, you've overcome these or you're, you're looking to um, overcome them. So I'm just kind of wondering, maybe Jeremy, if we could start with you, if you'd mind um, sharing your, your thoughts or experiences on this. 
Yeah, um, I had an experience I'll never forget. I, I was uh, a new administrator uh, starting out in a an, element, an elementary school, and um, we we wanted to jump on kind of the bandwagon of you know talking about bullying um, and and really getting down to the nuts and bolts of what bullying is, but in a way that our younger kids could understand, you know, particularly in elementary school. And at the time, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, GLSEN, um, had sponsored what they called the No Name Calling Week. And I'm like, okay, let's let's do this. Let's let's jump on board. And that's something really simple that that kids of that age can can really grasp. Um, and uh, we had started planning. We had a committee of our school social workers, some teachers on board, um, planning for what that week was going to look like. And just a few days before we were to kind of launch it. Um, we had uh, an administrator uh, in the district office put a halt to things. Um, and he said, no, this isn't a good idea. Um, I think it's great that you're talking about no name calling. Um, however, this is sponsored by Glisten, and we don't want to ruffle, ruffle people's feathers and, and get the community up in arms. Um, and um, unfortunately, we had to cancel that week, uh, move it to another month, um, and make sure that the Glisten name was off of it. And, and I think that just goes to show you know, how important leadership is in our school from um, from the top, um, because as much as we have individuals down on the ground wanting to do some of this work, um, it's just really easy for somebody to come in and just say no. And, and you don't really have a choice um, when you're, you know, you're working for somebody, you're working for a board, you're working for uh, an individual. So, um, uh, unfortunately, we, we did have to move that around, but um, you know we, we still talked about these things throughout the school year um, and made it an, an important part of what we did. Um, but we did we did take that name off. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jeremy. It's um, we, we were saying in the kind of discussion before before the recording about that idea of pushing where it moves, and and like you say that that experience is not something that is a throwaway experience. It's thinking about moving forward and and starting those discussions and. Um, seeing where people are at and where you can make those um, moves forward. So it, it sounds like it was um, a difficult but a, an important experience to have at your school. Um, Christina, maybe if we can uh, go over to you, if, if you would mind sharing some of your experiences with regards to this. Yeah, so I would say that the the largest barriers to LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus inclusion um, are, you know, the staff and the school culture. If staff are not on board and the work of this inclusion falls solely on queer staff and students, then the inclusion piece is not sustainable and it's going to not make such a big impact. You know, the staff with the greatest amount of power and the ability to make institutional and transformative change are often the people that are not faced with these marginalizations. And so if there are allies amongst our staff in the school, it's not enough to simply say, oh, you know, I'm an ally. Um, what personal amount of power and privilege are you willing to give up to ensure that LGBTQ plus students are not harmed um, and are actually centered in the school, whether that's, you know, throughout events, um, in the curriculum, um, in the text that we're using, you know, how are we centering these students and making them feel like they are visible? Um, and allies have to be part of the change and actioning the change. It's not enough to say, you know, oh, we don't have a problem with it, um, but not actually do anything about it. Um, if you're a true ally, you really are there to call out the injustice. And so I think the difficulty is with school culture, I guess, seeing that people don't necessarily care enough to make anything happen. And so that's one of the, the barriers. You know, a lot of the work falls on those that are marginalized in this way. Yeah, so so true and so important. Like you're saying, it, it shouldn't be um, just down to queer educators to make these advancements. Like it's it's for the greater good of everyone in the community, like you're saying, whether that's staff, leaders or students. So absolutely, you, you um, need to have other educators using their power to affect change as well so yeah that's a really really great point um if we can go over to you justin and if you'd mind sharing some of your experiences with regards to this sure um i want to first uh pre just say you know i appreciate christina what you were sharing and what um something you said stuck out to me in particular was how this work often falls on uh, queer people or marginalized individuals to do this work, whether it's through LGBTQ plus inclusion or um, diverse and equity inclusion. Um, but, and I know several 
educators personally who they have the queer educators they've been tasked solely with organizing this on their own um and i think the intention is oh this person is is queer they know they know about this more than i do they're just they should just be able to to do this then i don't want to get in their way but really what that does is that could create not only is it unfair uh, as it's burdening that teacher, that individual, but it also can create um, an instance of hypervisibility, where now the magnifying glass is sort of put on this teacher inadvertently, and they're kind of being a spokesperson for their community, right? And really, that's just, it's unfair to put that burden on someone else. So it really um, should be the work of, of, of everybody at the school. It should be a school-wide um, uh, issue to to resolve. Personally, um, I'm out being an out as a non-binary and with my pronouns um, for to, with parents, with students, with colleagues, and what Christina you said earlier about privilege. You know, I I do have the privilege of of doing this um, more or less safely, um, and I feel safe to do this. Um, that being said, there has been complaints in the past. Um, and I've been singled out um, several times and gaslit, um, especially when reading children's books in, in class. Um, but one thing that, and this was mentioned before, um, that has helped me move through it is tying it back to the mission and this vision of the school, because that's in writing. That's non-negotiable, right? In our school, we have a mission that's you know, we celebrate um, and respect diversity. You know, there's not an asterisk that leads to the bottom that says, except, da, 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 da. Um, so that's really a non-negotiable. And when that has been brought up, you know, that hasn't been challenged, thankfully. Um, so even though I'm, I'm filled with a lot of anger, anxiety, and frustration, but tying it into that like factual piece of the school um, has helped me sort of combat these micro and often macro aggressions. Yeah, no, so good, Justin. I think um, you're absolutely right. If you're bringing it back to the core values of the school and what they're about, they are completely in alignment with LGBTQ plus inclusion and it's, and it's kind of reminding um, schools of that piece is so important. Um, we've just had a question in from Katie. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, so the question we have here are, what kind of activities do you do to educate and work with your parent community? Um, and how do you include them in these conversations? Um, I just wonder if there's anyone would like to go to go first and have any thoughts on this particular question. Um, I, I can jump in. I, I think um, immediately my mind goes back to that vision mission type work um, and speaking from the level of administration. I think um, what I often try to do and especially now moving forward is when parents come to visit our schools, when parents um, you know, come to check out, is this a school I want for my son or my daughter or you know, my, my child? Um, making it very clear that this is what we believe in, this is what we do. Um, and I think setting that stage up front as, you know, and setting that message is this is, we're going to tackle some of these more difficult conversations and, and topics. And, um, but we're doing so in a, in a, in a way that uh, we want everyone to feel welcome and safe is really important. So for me, a lot of those conversations happen before even parents join our school, um, uh, because I want them to be clear as far as, you know, who we are, what we're going to, what we're going to be doing at, at school. Yeah, so so good. I, Christina, I, I thought you were looking like you were going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if you were going to like jump in first. Um, <laughs> I think that really resonates with me, what you said, Jeremy. Um, you know, starting at the admissions process, you know, that interview process before the student or family joins the school, it's really important to make that clear. And if I guess the message hasn't been made clear at that point, um, you know, what we should be doing as educators as well as being proactive um, if we're going to study a text or if we're going to be reading certain books throughout the year you know we probably shouldn't have to do this but you know sending an email home and just saying look this is what we're going to be doing this year this is um, the curriculum 
and letting them know in advance so that they are aware, I think is really important. I think waiting until a parent complains after something has happened leads to a lot more issues than if you're proactive about it and, and open about it and just not afraid to say, look, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it. Christina, that makes me think of, um, you know, I think that's a great idea of sharing with families when we're going to start having some of these conversations or what it looks like within our curriculum. Um, but I think alongside that often, I like to send home resources for parents to talk to their kids about things. Because obviously within the school day, you know, within a, a half hour, 45 minute lesson, kids are going to leave with some questions. They're going to probably go home and if they feel safe, they're going to ask their parents about that. And I mean, my guess is most parents don't have the, the, the knowledge or the, the vocabulary or you know, understand how to tackle some of these things. So if we can send home some resources as well for families to be engaged in this conversation um, and have the families learn alongside the children, I think that's that's one of the best moves we can make. A, a really, really um, great stuff and, and so important to, to consider the parent community in, in this and their role in supporting um, inclusion. Um, I, I know we're, um, we've got one more question to get to, so I'm gonna hand it back over to Laura for the next bit. Uh, yeah, so I mean, first of all, just thank you so much for those responses. I literally wanted to like clap and cheer <laughs> like every time you were talking. Um, and I think you've already, um, you know, given some great advice and some great perspectives. And this next question will kind of follow that on. So um, could we cue the next question, please? How can we as educators, leaders and parents move our international schools forward? Yeah, so just thinking about how, how we can move forward. And I think, um, like I say, you guys have already mentioned some really great advice in terms of speaking to parents and, and working with families. Um, but what about, you know, within our classrooms with the students? Um, I'm going to jump back to you, Justin, if you could maybe share some thoughts on that. Sure, yeah. And um, I have one thing to add to the, the parents piece that does fall into this as well. Um, when moving forward with educating parents, it's really important to understand the cultural perspectives that the parents are also operating from. So for example, I'm in Thailand, most of the parents are Thai and Chinese. Gender identity and sexuality um, is looks different in Thai and in Chinese. There's a lot of nuances that, um, um, that international schools, which typically operate from like an American or European sort of lens may not understand. Um, and what I recommend is schools to reach out to local organizations who are doing this work, who can really contextualize it for parents, for families, for schools. For example, in, in Chiang Mai, there's an organization called One Plus, um, and they're an uh, HIV, like oh, they have, they're an HIV testing center, but they also do a lot of anti-bullying work at local Thai schools. So there's really nothing stopping from schools in Chiang Mai from contacting them to see if they can host a PD or a talk or a workshop with parents. Um, not only are parents getting it from a, cult from like a cultural perspective that, that's uh, responsive to their needs, but they're also supporting a local organization that's doing a lot of really excellent work. Um, and as far as something in the classroom, um, like what y'all said before is like pushing where it moves, right? And I found that place to be um, with the classroom library. So I'm really intentional with searching for and vetting books to recommend for our classroom library to purchase. And not a lot of people at my school under, like know that the library has quite a large budget that is often not used. So I just like, keep sending books for them to order. And I, over the past year, I see the library being filled with books and like, I order that. I got that one like and just seeing all these great great <laughs> books um, available while at the same time i'm still working with admin to create more inclusive and equitable spaces on an administrative school-wide level which typically takes a little bit more time so i'm kind of dipping into both like okay there's a lot more immediate sort of um response here and this takes more time i'm still going to work on that but i'm not just going to wait for big changes and going to try to change and sort of the micro level as well. Yeah, no, that's, I really, I really like this idea of, <clears throat> yeah, ch creating change ourselves and, and where we can uh, sort of more immediately, but also recognizing that that long-term change, you know, is is 
bit more of an investment and, and requires us to bring in other people and admin and leaders uh, as well. Um, Christina, what's, what's your thoughts on how we can move our schools forward? Yeah, I feel like we've already touched a lot on, you know, helping the parent community. Um, and I just want to give one example of, you know, how we can kind of combat any, I guess, challenges there because you know a lot of our kids whenever they're playing um they often fall into those gender roles of you know a husband and wife or um relationships between male and female and you know that's never seen as a problem even as young as three you know there's always this encouragement for for kids to like oh let's hug let's have a little kiss um and that's never seen as a problem but then as soon as it's you know two girls doing it or two boys or you know any type of gender, um, that scene is then wrong. And, you know, I want to challenge that notion of parents saying, or educators, or just anyone in general saying that, you know, it's too young for students and kids to already start having these conversations. Um, but in terms of what we're doing at our school, you know, one of the more recent things that has happened is our school has introduced adding pronouns to our email signatures. And that sends such a great message to our school community and saying, we're not going to assume your gender and you belong here because we, we accept everyone. And it's just a starting point, but I'm so grateful that the school has taken that on board and that you know, staff are able to volunteer that information for the school community to see. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. And um, I, I really like, you know, the idea of, of the pronouns on the email signature and just small things you can do. I'm going to shout out for a minute, Emily Meadows, uh, you belong here posters, which are in your background. Uh, I was printing some of those off myself today. Um, and I think, uh, you know, these small things, I, I'm not sure people always understand what a big difference they can make to students who might be struggling with their identity, who might be wondering if they're safe or not. Um, so yeah, the small things can sometimes be the really, really big things. Um, Jeremy, what, what about you? Yeah, you know, um, part of my research, I um, with my my recent dissertation, I looked at the idea of heteronormativity, um, and and really simply, that's just the the idea that most people are walking around with um, this heteronormative picture, narrative, whatever it might be in their mind. So there's a man, there's a woman, um, the man and woman go off and get married. That's just what happens. Um, so I, I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. Um, I like to be somebody who assumes positive intentions. Um, I like to assume that people are doing the best they can with the knowledge they have at the moment they have it. And so, you know, rather than starting, you know, some sort of conflict or, or uh, you know, major issue at the school, I think one of the best things that we can do is just start asking some of those smaller questions. You know, why is it we do things this way? Um, have we considered X, Y, and Z? And I think just by starting some of those conversations um, are, are really important. Um, but I think that the number one things that we can do right now is just asking those questions um, and getting those conversations going. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to um, very quickly direct us to another question we've had come through, um, which is when moving forward as a school and seeking to instigate change, is it a case of baby steps over the long term or more ambitious changes and overhauls quickly? Um, Justin, I'm going to come back to you because you are the one who sort of talked about both of these being being important. Um, what advice would you give? Yeah, um, I think you, it's not necess not so much a a question of either or, I think you can kind of dip both toes in both pools, right? Um, and just like what we were said before, just push where it moves, see what's within your sphere of influence and work towards that while simultaneously um, starting those conversations on a, maybe a policy level um, and on an administrative level. Um, so it's really important to work in both aspects. If we're just going to focus on at the administrative level, things might change over a very long period of time when the student, the needs of the students in front of us are pretty immediate. Whereas if you're only focusing on sort of the micro level, um, those problematic policies um, and those systemic issues are still just going to stay the same. Um, and I want to also mention like the, the positive um, intent 
piece, Jeremy, that you were explaining, and I, I, I appreciate that. And it's and a lot of times I think people just they are operating from what they know. But I think it's really important to understand that while someone may have positive intention, the harm can be great. Um, so even though you know you might think some way, just I hope people understand that the effect can be quite profound. I just wanted to point that out too. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. I, and I think none of this stuff, as you said, is really black and white. And I think about this, you know, uh, this question that was just brought up, um, baby steps over long term, it's the same thing. I, I agree. It's it's not it's not black and white when when we're talking about these things. I think, um, you know, oftentimes I feel a sense of urgency because I know we have got kids lives at stake. Um, and I know that, you know, mistakes um, in in, you know, what we're doing at school can have really long term impacts on them. And so there's a part of me that says, no, we need to make these changes right now. We need to do these right, right now where we might lose the student here. Um, but then I also know oftentimes to do things well, we need to be thoughtful in doing that. And so there is that kind of give and take um, because we can make mistakes if we go too fast. And so I appreciate kind of that, you know, yes and um, idea that you, you presented. Totally. Yeah, and I'm just going to quickly jump in and say, you know, sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, you know, it is really important, like both of you have said, you know, we have to center our students and our kids because, you know, these statistics are there that prove that LGBTQ plus students and youth are at high risk of committing suicide and having suicidal thoughts. So it's really important that in everything that we do at school, we constantly center them. And yes, it may take some time. Um, but we need to make sure that we're moving forward and not operating in this paralysis stage. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. And really, I feel like we could talk and talk and talk um, and, you know, keep keep with the questions and discussions going all day. Um, but we are going to going to move on now um, and actually introduce our school spotlight. Um, so for the school spotlight today, we are going over to Christina um, and BBIS in Berlin. Um, so over to you, Christina. It's time for School Spotlight on Global Take, presented by School Rubric. Let's learn more about the stories and information from schools around the world. What's your school story? I'm so excited to present um, a little bit about BBIS uh, for this Global Take School Spotlight. Um, BBIS has been founded over 30 years ago, so we are quite, um, I guess, set in, in our place and we have been around for a while. Uh, we're an IB World School and we offer three programs, the Primary Years Program, the Middle Years Program and the Diploma Program. And we are accredited by CIS, MSA and CESS. We have over 700 day and boarding students and I'll talk a little bit more about our boarding school later on. We have over 60 nationalities represented amongst our students and we have 191 staff who come from 28 different nations and we're situated just a little bit outside of Berlin um, and you can see our beautiful campus there and we're situated in Kleinmachnow. So within our schools, we have over 700 students, as I mentioned, and they range from three years old all the way through to 19 years old. And our students spend most of their days developing the lifelong skills such as critical thinking, uh, many different languages and intercultural competencies across the early education program, the primary and the secondary programs. So from three to six years old, our students or our children join the early years um, early education community, and they take a lot of inspiration from the Reggio Emilio philosophy, Emilia philosophy. From ages six to 11, we have students in grades one to five who take part in the primary years program. And then from 11 to 19, we have the middle years and the diploma program. And in all of those programs, um, we really encourage the students to be pioneering and innovative, as is our mission statement. And we also have a BBIS boarding school um, it's the first English language boarding school in Germany, and we have about 70 students there. And the three main goals of the boarding school is to embrace a healthy lifestyle, to achieve their academic potential to the fullest, and to foster intercultural understanding. 
So we have many opportunities at BBIS uh, in terms of school life. We have many opportunities to engage with leadership so that the students can participate in the student ambassador program, the student council. We have a climate change uh, program where students can be part of the leadership team. Uh, we have so many different activities that take part both in school and outside of the school where we have external providers come in and allow the students another opportunity to engage with um, topics that cannot be part of the school curriculum. Um, but part of the school curriculum, you know, we have a great sports and athletics program where students pre-COVID could travel around Europe and Germany and participate in various sports from the ages of 11 through to 19 and represent the school. Uh, we have a great arts and design program, which really nurtures creativity. We have music and drama where students have the opportunity to embrace the performing arts and develop those the, the performing skills and the confidence in public speaking. Um, and like I mentioned, we have many extracurricular activities that students take part in, such as the garden club, um, pottery, uh, different types of musical instruments that are not part of our music program. And on top of that, we have our student support services program. We're very much uh, making sure we very much value inclusion at our school and making sure that we work in collaboration with staff, students, and parents to provide all students with the opportunity to excel. And we really want students to excel wherever they're at and we meet the students with their needs. Um, so we have learning support, school counseling, career and college counseling, um, health services, and of course, the home language program. And finally, I just want to mention you know, we uh, are right outside of Berlin, which is such a great city. And a lot of our families and our staff live in and around Berlin. And so it really is a great place to get involved with the different museums and, you know, the markets that are around Berlin, the activities that are on offer most weekends and throughout the week are really exciting. And we try to bring a lot of that onto our campus through different events, um, such as, you know, the Summerfest and Oktoberfest and the PTA has a lot of involvement in our school community. Thank you for traveling across the globe with us to learn more about international schools. To hear more from international educators and learn more about these fantastic institutions, tune in to our live Global Take episodes as we highlight international schools in our School Spotlight section presented by School Rubric. Thank you so much, Christina, for that uh, amazing school spotlight. Your school looks incredible. And um, of course, Berlin as well, I know is, is an amazing city. So really appreciate you sharing um, that with us. Before we sort of close up today, um, if people have found this helpful, please do share it um, You know, with colleagues, people who might be interested. Um, personally, I think there's been some really great advice um, shared today, and I'm sure it would be helpful for, for other educators. So uh, if you go to the school rubric or global take Facebook pages, Twitter pages, you'll be able to find the links to share. Um, there's also a Facebook group. If you'd like to join the Global Educators Network, you can connect with uh, other international educators from all over the world um, and obviously discuss all sorts of different things. Um, and finally, there will be a, a new episode of Global Take coming up uh, in just a few weeks. Um, so this is on the marketing and branding of your athletic program back with uh, Nick DeForest, uh, one of their regular hosts. So do check that out um, if that's something that would be interesting to you. Um, you. Yeah, and just to, to close up, I just want to, to say a huge thank you to all the guests today, to you, Jeremy, Justin, Christina. It's been incredibly insightful and um, powerful and so much uh, good stuff to take away. So I can't thank you enough for joining us. And I also want to thank uh, the viewers for joining us, for sending in some great questions and for sending in a lot of love. I've seen some love down the bottom. So um, I really, really appreciate it. So thank you all. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. See you, See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Thank you for watching School Rubric on YouTube. Make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe in order to stay looped in on all of our diverse collection of shows, interviews, panels, tutorials, and more from educators around the globe. And visit us at schoolrubric.com for even more great content such as our online articles, Interact Magazine, featured podcasts, and more. Thank you.